And I should point out that this is um, some of what I present is joint work with Sam Ballas, Alex Casella, and Lorenzo Ruffoni. And I'm talking about circle packings in complex projective space. So let me um, give you a quick outline of what I want to chat about. Uh, I've got two parts of this talk. And in the, the first part, what I'm really after is the KMT conjecture, the Kojima Mitsushima Tan conjecture uh, about packable surfaces. And, and to describe that, I want to talk about the theorem that they proved in 2003, the KMT theorem. But to talk about that, I, I need to talk about complex projective structures on surfaces. And I think that's unfamiliar enough to some folks in this audience um, that it makes sense to do a little tutorial on complex projective surfaces in the first half of the talk. So that's what the the first three or three or four items represent here. Um, I'm gonna look at geometric structures on surfaces and concentrate on the three structures we're interested in, the complex, the hyperbolic, and then the, the one that's most unfamiliar, the complex projective structures. And then I wanna talk about circles on complex projective surfaces so that we can go to the kerber andre and Thurston theorem, which all of us know here, and think about what it would mean to look at circle packings on these more general surfaces, the complex projective ones, rather than say hyperbolic ones. But I, the other thing I want to introduce is some classical material on the deformation spaces of these geometric surfaces and how they relate to each other. Because that's, that, that's sort of one of the nicest ways to frame this KMT conjecture. And then I'm going to pivot into um, part two of the talk in the second half hour. Uh, I'm going to pivot to non-compact surfaces. This is not the, the setting of the original KMT conjecture, but um, uh, Sam Ballas and Alex Casella and Lorenzo Ruffini and I got interested in, in the complex projective structures on non compact surfaces. And so what I'm going to do is talk about this a little and I'm going to restrict my attention to perhaps the, the, um, the simplest uh, non-compact hyperbolic surface, just the thrice punctured sphere. And we'll think about its geometric structures a little bit. And after that, I'm going to look at the work that Ballas, Casella, Ruf, Boney and I have done on trying to understand some of the uh, sort of deformation space of these thrice punctured spheres in the moduli space. And so I'll, I'll look here at some geometric ways of putting complex projective structures on the thrice punctured sphere. And then finally, I'll get around to circle packings and talk about uh, circle packing the hyperbolic and Euclidean thrice punctured spheres. Um, this is joint work with Lorenzo Ruffoni. And uh, in this, we'll see that the, the Kojima Mitsushima Tan conjecture fails in the, in the non compact setting. And let's see, I've got to move this along. And so, so let's get started with um, a, a diagram or a picture that is familiar to all of us. Uh, this is one of the first things we see when we uh, take any course on, say, differential geometry. And so here I have a, a surface and I'm looking at the charts on the surface. So recall that a chart is just a homeomorphism phi from an open set U in the surface down to a model space. And our model space, of course, is going to be the complex projective line. And if you don't like that, or you're not familiar, familiar with projective spaces, um, just realize that that's a fancy way to say the Riemann sphere. So think of CP1 as nothing more than the complex plane with a point at infinity. And of, of course, the way we, we get various structures on surfaces is we look at charts and we, we map our attention from the surface down to the target space. And then there are structures on the target space that we think of pulling back to the surface. And we have to make sure we do this in a consistent way so that if we use two different charts, to map down, then um, we're being consistent with what we're studying. And so we have these transition maps. 
And these tr transition maps are required to have certain properties. And depending on what properties we choose, we get different geometric structures. Uh, we normally choose this atlas, the, the, the set of these, these um, charts, to be maximal with respect to some properties. And so the, the one that I think is familiar to all of us are Riemann surfaces. And sort of this is flavor one of the geometric structures that I'm looking at. So in, in a Riemann surface, uh, I'm, it's sometimes called a conformal structure. The target space is just the complex plane, which lies inside of the uh, complex projective line. And the, the transition maps uh, going in the complex plane are just required to be conformal homeomorphisms or um, complex analytic maps with non-zero derivative. And, th and that's one of the natural ways to, to define a Riemann, the, the, surf, the structure of a Riemann surface or a conformal structure on a surface. Now, I think we're all familiar with that. And we're also familiar with hyperbolic surfaces. And there are different ways to describe hyperbolic surfaces. In the context of atlases, it's done this way. Um, this time, our, our target space is going to be uh, a disk in the complex plane. Uh, we're going to put the hyperbolic metric on that disk. So all of our, uh, the images of our charts go into the disk and the transition mappings across are required to be hyperbolic isometries. And for the purposes of this talk, it, it's important to know that the hyperbolic isometries of, of that disk are the same as the automorphisms of that disk, the, the conformal mappings of that disk to itself. And fortunately for us, that's precisely the Mürbis transformations that fix that disk. It's gonna be important that we know these hyperbolic maps or Mürbis transformations and what we pursue. But finally, the, the surfaces we're really interested in are the complex projective surfaces. And so this time the geometric structure looks at like this, the, the target space, is the, all of CP1, the whole Riemann sphere. And our, uh, our transition maps from one chart to another are just required to be Mervis transformations. So we might call this a Mervis structure. And we're, we're free to use any of the Mervis transformations in, as our transformations. Okay. And so, so I hope that gives you a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about a complex projective surface. Uh, and generally, we don't have a metric floating around on a complex projective surface that we can deal with, much like Riemann surfaces. Um, but we do have the notion of a circle, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's, it's important to note the following. It's important to note that if I start with a, uh, a hyperbolic surface, so my my charts go into the disk and the transition mappings are hyperbolic isometries, which happen to be Mervis transformations. Then I can enlarge that atlas by throwing in a bunch of charts where the transition maps are, instead of being hyperbolic isometries, are Mervis transformations. And so in a natural way, I can enlarge the hyperbolic chart to a complex, um, sorry, to a Mervis chart or to a a complex projective chart. So just throw in all charts that are consistent with the Mervis transformations you already have in the hyperbolic chart. But then we can do this enlargement again. We, it, we, we realize that in a complex projective surface, all the transition maps are Mervis transformations, but Mervis transformations are conformal maps. So we can enlarge that atlas by, by throwing in more charts and the charts we throw in are charts whose transition maps with the, with the um, CP1 charts already there are conformal maps. And so that enlarges the atlas to uh, uh, a complex atlas. And so in a very natural way, every hyperbolic surface determines uniquely a complex projective surface. So we can think of a hyperbolic surface as a CP1 surface. And then every CP1 surface determines uniquely a Riemann surface. And so a CP, CP1 surface has a natural um, conformal structure, making it conformally equivalent to exactly one Riemann surface. 
unfortunately, we can go back. We can go from a Riemann surface back to the hyperbolic surface with the uniformization theorem. And this, this is something I think most of us have seen also. So if we have a, a Riemann surface with a complex structure, we can go to the universal covering surface. And, and of course, that's a simply connected Riemann surface. And in the context we're dealing with, the uniformization theorem is gonna tell us that that is uh, conformally equivalent to the hyperbolic plane. And then the deck transformations are found to act as isometries on that plane. And so we recover the surface as the hyperbolic plane modulo the action of the fundamental group by isometries. And so we, we have this, this nice situation where beginning with the hyperbolic surface, we can enlarge the atlas to get a complex projective surface, enlarge again to get a Riemann surface, and then restrict back down to get a, the same hyperbolic surface. Now, you know, this is a talk about circle packings and, and the way that most of us who have looked at circle packings have worked with them on surfaces is we looked at a constant curvature metric on the surface, curvature zero, one, or minus one. And we look at circles, we understand what circles mean because they're just metric circles. But when you go to complex projective structures, all of a sudden you have another set of surfaces on which you can think about circles. Because after all, Mervis transformations are the maps that preserve circles. So if I have a curve, um, so this is just some sort of curve on a surface. And I ask, well, is this something I should think of as a circle? Well, what I do is I choose a chart in my complex projective structure. I map down to the complex projective line and by homeomorphism. And I look at the part of that arc that the image of that part of the arc that goes through my chart. And if that is part of a circle, if that's an arc of a circle, and if that's true for every, every time I look at a chart that touches this curve C, then I'm gonna call that curve C a circle up in that complex projective surface. And so we're going to get different types of circles. Now, some circles could be like this, where when you cut along them, they don't found a disc, but they may be cut a handle in two. Some circles are going to be on disc. And of course, those are the ones we're gonna be interested in when we talk about circle packings. And so maybe I should say disc packings, that's a, a, a more descriptive word. And I, I just want to point out for hyperbolic surfaces, of course, the circles that bound disc are exactly the metric circles. But again, in general, there is no metric on a complex projective surface that defines the circles. So we have the notion of circles, well-defined notion of circles on complex projective surfaces, but we don't have a metric necessarily that gives those circles. So um, a couple of notes, um, we, uh, oftentimes your hyperbolic structure is just given by a Riemannian metric of constant curvature minus one. And for CP1 surfaces, I'm not gonna dwell on this much, but uh, for aficionados, the CP1 surfaces are often given by a developing map and a holonomy representation. And the only thing I wanna say about this is something about the developing map. Uh, so start with the CP1 surface, a complex projective structure on the surface, go to the universal cover, and that's what this stands for, and transfer that that complex projective structure up to the universal cover. You now get uh, this simply connected surface, a disc, a disc with a complex projective surface. And there's a natural way to map that down to the Riemann sphere. You take one chart on this simply connected surface and look at the image under the chart map that maps into the Riemann sphere. And then you analytically continue that along this whole surface. And that gives you what's called the, the developing map of that complex projective surface. And the thing about the developing map is that it's always a, a local homeomorphism. And, and that means you can, you can view um, objects on the surface in the complex plane by lifting the object up to the universal cover and then applying the developing map. 
And because it's locally one-to-one, -one, at least locally, it's going to preserve the properties of that object. And, and so, for example, um, a circle in a complex projective surface will lift to a curve, uh, and what we would call a circular arc in the universal cover. And then the developing map would push it down to a circle in the complex plane. Uh, there's also this holonomy representation, and I, that's really not going to come into play in what I talk about. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Let's try this. Okay, Kirby Andre of Thurston, I'll go through this one very quickly because everyone knows this. Um, I'm interested in the tangency ver version of the theorem. So we're going to let S be a surface and K a simplicial triangulation of S. And we know that K determines an essentially unique metric of constant curvature. If the surface is non-compact, then we want to put the complete in there, a complete metric of constant curvature and a univalent circle packing, which I'll denote as C of K. It's just a collection of circles indexed by the vertex set of K. And this collection of circles has the combinatorics of K. And, and by that, of course, I mean that um, each, each of these circles is a metric circle in this surface of constant curvature that bounds a disk. Whenever I have an edge in my complex K, the circles intersect in a single point. I've got a picture up here. Whenever I have a face of K, an oriented face, then uh, the three circles determine an oriented interstice, as in this picture here. And of course, univalent just means the, the disc or pairwise disjoint. So I'm not allowing uh, circles to go around, uh, 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 the set of circles tangent to a single one to go around it more than once. And so that's something we're all very familiar with. Uh, what, what we're really thinking about when we bring complex projective surf surfaces into the mix is, can we do for those what uh, Thurston did for uh, constant curvature surfaces? Can we pack them in similar ways? Now, now to talk about the, the KMT conjecture, which I'll do in parts five and six, I need to remind you of what deformation spaces of geometric surfaces are. And I'm going to tell you how I want you to think about this if you're not familiar with these ideas. Um, I'm going to fix a compact topological surface of genus two. And that's because I want to deal with hyperbolic structures. And then, then I can endow S with my three types of structures, the, the complex structure, making it into a Riemann surface, the hyperbolic structure, making it into a constant curvature minus one surface, and then the complex projective structure. And for each of these, we have, we have a deformation space or a moduli space. Uh, for the Complex structures, it's usually called the Teichmuller space. And this is the moduli space of what are called marked complex structures. The way to think about this is the following. Uh, a, a, surface, a point in this moduli space represents a fixed complex structure on the surface. So a fixed Riemann surface structure. And the marking is just, uh, an indication of the generators of a fundamental group. The marking, don't worry about, it's not important. The important thing here is the way to think about this is if I have two different points, then they represent two different structures on the surface. And it turns out it's a classical theorem that the deformation or the moduli space, the type muter space for Riemann surface of genus G has dimension 6g minus 6. In fact, it's homeomorphic to R6g minus 6, 6g minus 6 dimensional Euclidean space. Now we can do a similar thing with the hyperbolic structures. Two different points in this deformation space essentially represent two different, that is non-isometric metrics of constant curvature on the surface up to marking. It turns out that this is also 6G minus six dimensional. And then the, the one that's least familiar to us, I think is the moduli space of 
the MART complex projective structures. Uh, again, if I take two different points in this moduli space, then I'm going to get two different complex projective structures, ones that are not equivalent or isomorphic in that category. And it turns out that, that this one is a Euclidean space of precisely twice the dimension of the Teichmuller space it, as dimension 12G minus 12. And you know, what is the relationship? How, how do these um, spaces, these moduli spaces interact with each other? Well, re remember that we have this, we have this, this little map that says, if I, if I start with a hyperbolic structure, I can enlarge the atlas to get a complex projective structure. I'm gonna call that mapping I. I can take the complex projective structure and I can enlarge it to get a conformal structure or the structure of a Riemann surface. I'm gonna call that map F. And then I can go back by uniformization to the hyperbolic surface. And let me make this a little smaller. So I get everything in here. And so, so this gives us this picture of mappings between these deformation spaces. I've got the traditional, the uh, classical Teichmuller space down here, the complex structures on the surface of uh, sitting above that. In fact, this is a fiber bundle. Uh, sitting above that, I've got the complex projective surfaces. Included in the complex projective surfaces is, are the hyperbolic surfaces. And I've got this, this so-called continuous section that is a homeomorphism. So this is, in fact, an analytic homeomorphism from the Teichmuller space to the space of hyperbolic structures. And so it embeds the type meter space back on, into the deformation space of the complex projective structures. And if I take a, a Riemann surface, so X represent a Riemann surface, the, the fiber, the pre-image under this map F, this is called the forgetful map. We forget the Mürbisch structure and retain only the conformal structure when we apply F. And so the, the fiber sitting over this Riemann surface consists of all those complex projective surfaces that are conformally equivalent to that Riemann surface. That's the way to think about it. In this fiber, all the points in this fiber represent complex projective surfaces that are conformally equivalent to one another. And it turns out that the fiber dimension is also 6G minus six. So there's a a 6G minus 6 continuous family of complex projective surfaces that are all conformally equivalent to one another. And I've got a cartoon picture of all this information. This, this picture actually helps me uh, organize this and see it better than, than the previous diagram. Um, the, the yellow is the space of all the complex projective surfaces. So every point in the yellow represents a complex projective structure on my surface S. And I've got this forgetful map down that takes the complex projective surface and identifies the Riemann surface it's conformally equivalent to. But then I've got this continuous section going up by the uniformization theorem that takes a, a Riemann surface and identifies the unique hyperbolic metric, metric of constant curvature negative one, that in the conformal class of that surface. And so the, the, the set of hyperbolic surfaces is the red, and that's homeomorphic to the Teichmuller space down here. The fiber sitting above a single point are all the complex projective surfaces that are conformally equivalent to one another. Okay. Now, the, the original KMT conjecture was not stated in terms of deformation spaces, but um, over the years since that original conjecture, it, it has been reinterpreted in terms of, of these moduli spaces. And so we'll see that in a few minutes. So, so let's now, I think we've got enough now to, to talk about the Kojima-Mitsushima-Tan theorem. 
Uh, this is from their paper of 2003. I'll, I'll have references at the end of the talk. Um, so, so we're going to start with a simplicial triangulation of a surface. We're going, and the surfaces, remember, are always genus G, greater than or equal to two, and at this point, they're compact. Uh, the curve boundary of Thurston theorem tells me that I've got this unique hyperbolic metric supporting a circle packing. packing. I'm going to call that the Thurston metric on that surface. That gives me a, a geodesic triangulation of the surface by connecting the circle centers with, with geodesic arcs. And I'm going to call the complex projective surface the, uh, I've got something wrong here. Isn't that funny how, how we make these up and we read them over and over and we always have something wrong. Uh, the, not the complex projective surface, the hyperbolic surface. So the hyperbolic surface uh, determined by this Thurston metric is gonna be called the cat solution. And the, the question one might have once one introduces these complex projective surfaces and looks at the, the um, Kerber Andre of Thurston theorem, realizing that a triangulation gives rise to a circle packing on a hyperbolic surface, which is a complex projective surface. Well, are there complex projective structures other than that of the Thurston metric that have a circle packing in the pattern of K, in the same pattern of K? And this is the question that uh, the Kojima, Mitsushima, and Tan addressed. And so let me tell you a little bit about this. So let, let's fix the triangulation. This is a simplicial triangulation of my surface. I'm gonna let pack K denote the collection of all the K packable complex projective surfaces. So by that, I mean, I've got a complex projective surface, K packable, I, I mean what you think it means. Every vertex of K corresponds to a circle in this complex projective surface. And two circles meet at a single point or tangent whenever uh, the circles are correspond to an edge of the complex. And of course they, they bound an interstice when three circles bound a face or when three vertices bound a face. And I'm gonna, now, now this is a, a collection of of complex projective surfaces. So that collection lies in the deformation space of the complex projective surfaces. And we, so we've got a nice topology on this. And the question is, can I deform the, the complex projective structure of the, the CAT solution with a Thurston metric? Can I deform away from that and retain the packability condition in the pattern of K? So can, can I go to this Teichmuller space and if, if this is a hyperbolic surface that is, has the Thurston metric on it, supporting a circle packing in the pattern of K, can I move into the yellow and retain the packability condition? So the, that's the question that uh, Kojima, Mitsushima, and Tian addressed in this paper. I'll repeat this um, at the end with references, but this is a paper from 2003, and they answer this affirmatively. In fact, they, they prove two things. Um, so they, they prove that, so here are, here's pack K. So this is the collection of complex, each point here corresponds to a complex projective surface that has a circle packing following the combinatorics of K. Uh, they show that there's a neighborhood of the, of the Thurston metric point, that is the neighborhood of the CAT solution that is homeomorphic to R6G minus six. So that's this green region. And it embeds in the deformation space of complex projective structures. So it embeds, now it did, they, they don't know what happens beyond that neighborhood. It doesn't necessarily have to be embedding and embedding as far as they know. But you can always, what this says is you can always go to the Thurston surface and deform it a little away from the hyperbolic. 
you can't deform it along the hyperbolic subset because, because the, of the uniqueness of the Thurston metric, but you can deform into the complex projective surfaces that are not hyperbolic and retain packability. Now, the other thing that they proved was that um, if you have a triangulation with exactly one vertex, now that's not simplicial, but uh, I'm going to lift that to the universal cover, and there I expect it to be simplicial. They proved that if K has exactly one vertex and lifts to a simplicial triangulation of the universal cover, then PAC-K is in fact homeomorphic. So not just this neighborhood, but all of PAC-K is homeomorphic to R6G minus six. And this led them to conjecture the following. This, I don't think this is the way the conjecture is stated usually today because it's developed, but in their original statement, uh, the KMT conjecture to, it took this form. Uh, for any simplicial triangulation K of the surface S, pack K, so not just for the ones with one vertex, but pack K, the packable complex projective surfaces packable with respect to K is homeomorphic to R6G minus six, which embeds into the deformation space of the complex projective structures. But let's refine this a little bit. Um, in fact, the, the black here is the way I like to think about it. Uh, so for any simplicial triangulation K of S, for any complex structure X on S, so now I'm thinking of the Riemann surface, there is a unique complex projective structure that's in the fiber over X. So it's conformally equivalent to X and is packable by K or said in this way, given a Riemann surface S, there is a unique CP1 surface that it, there's a unique structure, complex projective structure on S that's conformally equivalent to this Riemann surface that is packable in the pattern of K. To me, this is a really a very attractive conjecture. You, we, we know from Thurston that if we have a triangulation of a Riemann surface, then we can find a constant curvature, a unique constant curvature metric that supports a circle packing for that. And well, sorry, if we have a topological surface, there's a unique one. This says, well, it says more than that. It says, take any Riemann surface. So start with a complex structure. Then I can find a unique complex projective structure. So not a hyperbolic, but a complex projective one that supports a circle packing. So another way to say this, well, there are a couple more ways to say this more fancily. Uh, for, for simplicial triangulation K of S, the forgetful map restricts to a homeomorphism from the packable surfaces to the tachymeter space. And another way to say it is for every simplicial triangulation K of S, uh, every such thing determines a smooth section of the Teichmuller space into the deformation space of complex projective surfaces. And that's a bunch of words that make more sense when you look at a picture, like most things. I like these pictures. So remember, the yellow consists of the complex projective st structures. The blue is the Teichmuller space. This consists of the the ways to make my surface S into a Riemann surface, so the, the conformal structures. I've got a, the hyperbolic structures are sitting inside of the complex projective structures. And, and that projection, th this forgetful map from the blue hyperbolic structures down to the conformal structures is a homeomorphism. And the conjecture of KMT is that if I fix K and I just look at the, the complex projective surfaces that support a circle packing for K, then it looks like this. That is, there is a section, there's a continuous, in fact, diffeomorphism from the tight meter space up to pack K, the set of packable surfaces. And um, this sort of thing would hold for any, 
triangulation K. So I've, I've got a picture of pack K here, but then I've got another picture for pack L, which I seem to have erased. That's what this or orange is. Let me put that in there. So this is pack L. So for, for each, that this says for each triangulation, I'm going to have a section of the type meter space spanning up here, and it'll touch the hyperbolic section in exactly one point. So as I've shown in this picture. So that's the conjecture. I, I, I view this as really a very attractive conjecture. Um, one strategy for proving this is mapped out here. Uh, you might show that first that pack K is a manifold of the correct dimension, 6G minus six. Then show that the restriction of the forgetful map to the packable surfaces is locally injective. Then show that that restriction is proper. And then show that pack K is connected. So one through three plus invariance of domain implies that uh, the forgetful map restricted to the packable surfaces is a covering map. And then once the pack K is connected, we get the KMT conjecture. And the only progress I'm going to report on this is from 2018. Uh, Jean-Marc Schlinker and um, A. Mola verified step three. And as far as I know, um, that's the only part of this that has been verified. This is a very nice paper. Um, my group, uh, Sam Ballas and Lorenzo and Alex went through this uh, about a year ago year and a half ago after it first appeared. And I recommend this to anyone who's interested in this. It's very nicely written, uses a lot of really neat hyperbolic geometry, in particular, three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry to prove part three. And I wanna give a, uh, a shout out to Y Lamb. He's going to give a talk on Friday. And I, I've got it wrong here. I said circle packings. I think it's circle patterns on surfaces with complex projective structures. And I, I haven't talked to him, so I don't know what he's going to talk about. But his abstract says he's going to give an update on this. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, let me pause here. I'm, I'm ready to pivot into the non-compact case. Are there any questions so far? You're like my students. I hear nothing when I say, are there any questions? <laughs> so let me pivot to part two. Uh, I want to look at non-compact surfaces. And, and you know, there are always similarities and differences with a compact case. Um, we're going to be restricting our attention to surfaces with punctures. So what are called finite type surfaces. So I've got a, a, a surface of finite genus and I puncture it at n places, pop n holes into it, remove n points. The type Mueller theory is very well behaved for these, these sorts of surfaces. Um, the, in fact, the, uh, the type Mueller space, the deformation space of these surfaces or the deformation space of the complete, and there are complete hyperbolic metrics on these surfaces is a Euclidean space again of an appropriate dimension. But here's something rather interesting. Uh, things break down when you look at, go from the, either the, the complex structure, conformal structures or the hyperbolic structures and look at the complex projective structures uh, because this thing is always infinite dimensional. And I'll give an indication of why you might expect that in a minute, but let me, let me give a comparison of, of compact and non-compact information. Uh, so first of all, the, the, is the, the tight Mueller space is homeomorphic to the space of hyperbolic structures. That is, every conformal structure determines a unique, complete hyperbolic structure. And that's true in both the compact and non-compact case. But when you go to the complex projective sur surfaces, you get twice the dimension in the compact case, twice the dimension of the tachymeter space, but you get infinite dimensional in the non-compact case. The, the, Kirby Andre of Thurston theorem holds in both cases. There's a unique metric or complete metric, hyperbolic metric that determines a circle packing. If you look at all packable surfaces, so, so 
Let PAC be the union of PAC K. These are the K packable surfaces. So these are the complex projective surfaces supporting a circle packing for K. Union that over all triangulations. Then in the compact case, PAC is a countable dense subset of the tachymeter space. But in the non-compact case, um, everything's packable. So every, that, that is every hyperbolic complete hyperbolic metric on a non-compact surface supports a circle packing of some kind. So th this is a, a difference. Uh, whenever you're hyperbolic and packable, you have only have a countable dense set, whereas here, everything is packable. Yeah, then, Phil, one yeah. question. Yes. Yeah, for KAT on that line, um, are the Ks infinite? The, the, yes. Yes, for, 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 so the, these need to be um, triangulations that fill out the surface. Yes, so they are infinite over here. This, by the way, is very similar to a very recent uh, paper from the archives that, that um, is really off topic, but I wanna mention it, um, equilateral surfaces. So these are surfaces that are obtained by gluing equilateral triangles together. And when you do that, you get the structure of a conformal structure, you get a Riemann surface. And for the compact case, the equilateral surfaces are countable and dense in the tachymeter space. But Bishop and Rimp in a paper from uh, last week, just appeared on the archive, uh, proved that all surfaces of finite topological type are equilateral and therefore support what are called belly maps. And that's sort of an interesting difference. That, that, uh, that reflects what happens with the packability in the previous line. And then, then the KMT conjecture, what we've been talking about, is open in the compact case. I'll show you that it's false in the non-compact case, which is not surprising because there's, there's so much room in the non-compact case that, that you're able to push things around. So, so let's move to the non-compact case. And I'm gonna restrict my attention to the, as I said, the simplest, absolutely the simplest hyperbolic uh, non-compact surfaces. And, and that's the thrice punctured sphere. So, so take the three, the, sorry, the two dimensional sphere and pull out three points, X, Y, and Z. That gives you a Riemann surface. Uh, there's a unique conformal structure. There's a unique Riemann surface if there are actually points that you pulled out. But I'm pulling out topological points, so I'm allowing you actually to enlarge those points to holes. And when you do that, there's a three-dimensional family of structures. And so you can, in general, if you, if you take uh, a, uh, the Riemann sphere and you use a hole puncher to punch out three holes, or maybe for some of the holes, you just, you just use a a little spike and you push out a single point. Uh, each of those gives you a Riemann surface and it supports a single, a unique, complete hyperbolic metric. And this is supposed to indicate a picture of such a thing. So we've got three infinite area ends here. This is where I've punched out three holes instead of three punctures. And when you do that, each of these ends is going to be bounded by uh, a, um, a, 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 what do you call those things? Uh, a shortest length curve, locally shortest length curve. And uh, that's going to cut out this pair of pants, which we can then uh, cut out with, with these orthogonal arcs, hyperbolic arcs. These are hyperbolic curves. And so we can cut the, this into a couple of hyperbolic hexagons. And we can use the lengths A, B, and C, or capital A, capital B, capital C, which is what I'll use to parameterize these. And when A is equal to zero, for instance, then, then the X that I've pulled out represents a cusp rather than an infinite area hyperbolic N. So we've got these, the, in that case, we don't have a geodesic curve that goes around like this because it's been pushed out to infinity. But I think you, you probably have a good understanding of this sort of thing. Uh, here's a picture of the, the this space we're dealing with. So this is my R3, my capital A, B, C space. 
I put this point on the end, that's the zero, zero, zero. That's when I have three cusps. Um, I've got the hyperbolic structure sitting here. I guess that's my ABC, the hyperbolic structures. And then I've got the complex projective structures. And this is an infinite dimensional space. So, so this is not a, a uh, good schematic picture of what's happening because this is always infinite, infinite dimensional. In fact, the fibers are infinite dimensional. For instance, if you go to, to this point, this, this corresponds to the thrice punctured sphere. The complete hyperbolic metric has three cusps. You get it by gluing together two ideal hyperbolic triangles. And there's only one conformal structure on that represented by this point. But if you look at the fiber over it, this fiber is infinite dimensional. There, and it, there's an infinite dimensional family of complex projective structures on the thrice, the conformally thrice punctured sphere. I think that's probably what I said here. So let me, let me move on. Uh, let me talk about, you know, why infinite dimensional? How is this infinite dimensional? Why are there so many structures? Well, let me take something simpler. Let me take the sphere and let me puncture it. In fact, let me poke a hole in it with a hole punch. So a hole of positive radius at one point. That gives me a disk. And there's only one conformal structure on that disk, making it the, in, into a hyperbolic plane, say. It makes it into a disk in the complex plane. But what about the complex projective structures? Well, take any simply connected domain um, that's a proper domain in the complex plane, that defines a complex projective structure on your disk. I mean, there's the chart, there's, uh, there's one chart. Now add all the charts that are compatible with that one. And so this defines what I mean by circles in this. That gives me one point in the parameter space. And if I go to a different simply connected domain, and I've indicated this to be more complicated by pulling out these arcs, uh, one that's not conformally equivalent, or they're conformally equivalent, sorry. One that's not Mervis equivalent. So take any, not, any other simply connected domain, proper domain in the plane. These will be conformally equivalent. There's only one conformal structure. That's Riemann mapping theorem. But these are going to be, the only time these are going to be the same complex projective structure is when you get one from the other by applying a Mervis transformation. And of course, that usually doesn't happen. In fact, you can get worse than this. Uh, take any, let D be a disk, a topological disk in the plane, and let H be any locally injective map. So continuous function, locally one-to-one -one into the complex projective line or into the Riemann sphere. Then that defines a projective structure because what are charts, you take a, a point here, take a little neighborhood and just follow it over by H, a small enough neighborhood that H restricted to that neighborhood is a homeomorphism. That gives you a complex projective structure over here. And if you have two of these maps, H1 and H2, the only time you get equivalent complex projective structures is when one is equal to the other followed by a Mervis transformation. And so, for instance, in this picture, if I were to, if I were to come over here, and change my map, my map H to say H2. And H2 looks just like H1, except for over here, I just put a little dimple in it. So that little piece, you say the image of, uh, I've taken a little part of the disk and I've deformed it out. That'll be a different, a close complex projective structure, but different from the other one. And so you can, I think, see intuitively that this is gonna be a very, very large deformation space. And this always happens in the non-compact case for complex projective sur surfaces. So if we're gonna study these things, we need to get a handle on this infinite dimensionality. Um, it's very confusing. There, there's, uh, people have just started looking at how crazy this stuff is and, and trying to understand these deformation spaces. So Sam Ballas and Alex Casella and Lorenzo Ruffini and I started looking at this and, and we, we were trying to look at uh, structures on the thrice punctured sphere. That's what we began with. And we were looking at some 
some simple structures that you get by, by taking a, a triangle whose edges consist of circular arcs and doubling those, taking a reflection and building surfaces by pasting two of them together. And we eventually were able to prove the following theorem or look at the following situation. Uh, so we're going to start with a, I better get going or I'm not gonna finish this. We're gonna start with a complex projective structure um, on X and whenever on a Riemann surface X, when I do that, I'll use X sub sigma for that complex projective surface. I'm looking at the thrice punctured sphere and there are these peripheral curves that go around the sphere. I'm gonna to go to the universal cover. I'm going to pull the complex projective structure on X sigma back to the universal cover uh, and call that X tilde sigma. And then we're gonna look at the developing map. And remember all that means is I'm gonna take a little neighborhood here, push it down here and look at the chart look at a chart of that and analytically, analytically continue that. And so that gives me a mapping of this whole X sigma tilde into the Riemann sphere. And that's called the developing map. And each peripheral curve like this gives rise to a deck transformation, which I've indicated by Delta. And that deck transformation gives rise to a holonomy representation of that deck transformation. So it's a, an actual, uh, transformation, Merbus transformation. In this case, it's elliptic that up here moves these two triangles to the next two and down here reflects that by moving these two triangles to another two. So th this is how the, how um, things work in complex projective surfaces. And we're gonna call this a tame structure if this developing map extends continuously to these ends. So there are, there's a natural way to define these accountable set of points that are the ends of these triangles. And there's a natural topology to put on it. The neighborhood base is given by these horocyclic curves, what's well, bounded by the horocyclic curves. And in that, in that natural topology, this countable set is actually a discrete set. And so we're gonna first restrict our attention to structures that have a tame developing map. And then the second thing we're gonna do is restrict our attention to structures where this holonomy representation, so the deck transformation is represented down in the Riemann sphere by a Mervis transformation. And we're gonna restrict our attention to ones that look like this, ones that have um, elliptic Mervis transformations. So we call these relatively elliptic holonomy representations. And um, if we do that, then we, 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 we get something that's sort of manageable and that we can study. And so I'm gonna let this P with a funny O up there be the set of complex projective structures that are both tame and relatively elliptic, exactly of this type. And Ballas, Casella, Rufoni and I proved that uh, this space of structures is homeomorphic to R3. There's a three parameter family that besides these structures. And each of these is obtained by a sequence of what are called two pi graftings along ideal arcs. I'm gonna tell you what that means. Starting with a, what's called a circular triangle stru triangular structure, X sub tau. And what does all this mean? Well, first of all, wh what is this X sub tau, this circular triangular structure? Well, you start with a circular triangle. And I've got pictures of two circular triangles here. They are triangles where each edge is an arc of a circle and these three circles meet mutually. And so you usually think of something like this as a circular triangle or something like this, and those are. And if you glue two of these small triangles together along those edges, you get a incomplete hyperbolic metric on the thrice punctured sphere. And that's one way to get a complex protective structure. And you, you can do the same thing with this little triangle and you get an incomplete spherical metric in that case. But you can take these more general triangles, one that goes around here, back, back, or here, here, and back, and other crazy things. We catalog all the possibilities in this paper. And you 
double these. That is, you glue two copies of these together, but how do you do that? You have to reflect a lot. You have the second copy is gotten by reflecting along the circle. So it would be this big copy out here and there's a gluing map. And generally you will not have a metric on these and you will for some, you'll have a hyperbolic metric here, a spherical metric here, but for some of these other ones, for instance, this one, there's no metric that's going to give you the circles in that complex protective structure. So we catalog all the possibilities here. And then we're gonna show you how to get other ones by this grafting idea, which comes from the, the compact theory. Uh, so think of this as my original triangular surface, X tau. I'm gonna take an ideal arc. So an arc that goes from a ideal point to an ideal point. There's a green one here. There's a blue one here. And we're gonna cut along the arc. So cut along the blue. And now take a copy of the Riemann sphere and cut along an arc. And now glue this copy by taking one side of this and gluing it to one side of the cut and the other side gluing to the other side of the cut. So you fill in this region with a copy of the Riemann sphere. Or you can fill in this region with a copy of the Riemann sphere. We cut along the green, open it up, and fill in with a copy of the Riemann sphere. That's called grafting. The, you can do less than two pi grafting, but we're interested in two pi grafting because we're, the two pi grafting preserves what's called the holonomy representation. And we're interested in, in studying the holonomy fibers. And that's part of why we're doing two pi grafting. Um, so we have these surfaces and boy, do I have to get out, out of here. And we have a moduli space for the surface, it's R3. And it has a very nice structure. So A, B, C are the moduli and there's this tetrahedron from zero to these points on the ABC axis. Inside that tetrahedron are the ones that support an incomplete hyperbolic metric. On the face, the blue face spanning pi, pi, and pi are the ones that support a uh, metric of curvature zero, a flat metric. And then in this box outside the blue are the spherical ones. And then beyond that, in all these directions, are ones you get by grafting. And so there are these grafting maps that take this cube and, and fill out the, the whole first octant of R3 to give us the moduli space. And how do you circle pack these things? Well, I'm going to take a, a simplest case. I'm gonna take a hyperbolic triangle. I'm gonna glue the sides together to get a X sigma a hyperbolic surface. It'll be incomplete in general. I'm gonna take an infinite triangulation of this object. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as a union of KNs. These are cores. And I get those by uh, going to the triangulation and cutting off the ends of the triangulation and then coning those off. So I build a finite triangulation from K, but an infinite sequence of them whose, I guess K bar is the cone thing. Uh, the K ends fill out K. And then when I bar a K in, I do the cone. I then circle pack this, my, my surface with the complex protective structure in the pattern of, and I should have said K bar. The cone points correspond to uh, curves along the cone type singularities. Those, that's what I have here are cone type singularities. And I take a limit as n goes to infinity to get a packing of the whole thing. The problem is I don't necessarily get a packing of the whole thing. And I'm gonna finish up right here. Um, I may get a packing along an N of um, just a annular region like this. And what I need is a packing that goes all the way to a point. So I may, my packing may look like this and I have to decide between them. And fortunately there's something called vertex extremal length that allows me to decide. And I'm out of time. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, let me just tell you that there is technology that allows you to figure out 
which of these two situations occur, and you're guaranteed that you can make this one occur. And the other thing I'll say is how do you do the packing of the surface with cone type singularities? Well, that's from an old paper of mine from 1993, which gives some, some conditions. This will be this will be posted, but it gives conditions that guarantee that you can do the packing. And I know I rushed there at the end, but thank you very much for your attention. And these are the references uh, from the talk. But let me stop and see if there are any questions. Thank you, Phil. Very nice talk. Uh, wonderful pictures. Thank you. And um, so I'll open it up for questions. Okay. I think you can uh, stop screen sharing now. Oh, yeah. and, well, okay. maybe leave it up for a minute, whether okay. whatever you like, but it'll be posted Okay. later. Yeah, Edward. So is there any analog of this KMT conjecture for homothety structure? For, for what kind? Homothety. So you're taking a, oh, just um, the yeah, I, have, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I don't know. I, I, that's a good question. Um, I don't because know. Because those don't come with metrics. Right. So it's a little bit similar, but it's a smaller dimension of uh, smaller dimensional group, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. I, I've seen some work on affine structures and packing well, those. Ken, yeah, Ken, um, Ken and uh, was it a student of yours, Ken? Um, um, yeah, Chris, Chris Sass. Was that, yeah, about the same time as the KMT conjecture, uh, Ken and a student worked on some affine, well, with the torus, right, and the affine structures, and um, pretty much did the conjecture. Uh, I mean, showed that they, they can all be, if, if you fix K, you can, you can get packings of all affine tori. I think there was a two to one. Well, you get uh, you still have some of the um, same questions that are open about um, properness, right? And right. Um, yeah, and the conjecture is it's a, a simple branched double cover, right? So there are still open questions for the torus, and so um, yeah, that's one of the questions um, because I I still think those open questions for the case of the torus. Might, I, they're um, fascinating to me. I, they're, they're, yeah. and, and the techniques, I think, are very different. I mean, in, in genus two and above, very much hyperbolic geometry comes into play, two and three dimensional. Whereas in, in the torus, of course, that doesn't happen. And you know, what I've seen is your paper, I've read through that, and very, very different techniques.